yourself in flesh, born incarnate, fully God, fully man, 
to be the Savior. We worship you, O oh God. Amen. You may be seated. There's a reason why I chose to sing those songs where we remind ourselves that God is God, He is Almighty. And I thought of this children's sermon, so there might be some kids watching this at home. Uh, and and how many of you, when you were younger, would uh, dare to have an arm wrestling contest? Yeah. Any of you ever do a leg, old-fashioned leg wrestling contest? Anybody ever do that? Okay, so we've done that. That's, a, that's much more involved. <laughs> um, but an arm wrestling contest uh, among equals, that's what that first uh, picture might remind you of. But, but then again, there's, a, there's another time where we might turn to, to Dad and uh, dare him for a wrestling or mom, I see there. Uh, how, how do you think that goes? How do you think that goes? <laughs> With that, you know? Um, a, a loving dad is going to lose, isn't he? Now, uh, I, I think there are some men that are so competitive that will only lose for a little bit, and then we got to show them who's who's got the muscle. But I, I think I think that it's it's common enough that uh, that dad, mom in this case, loses, and it doesn't have anything to do with being almighty, does it? When they become teenagers, then dad has to lose. Okay, yeah. Let me repeat that for everyone's benefit. <laughs> When they become teenagers, <laughs> that's when Dad, is, for all his work, he's trying to catch up. But I, I want to focus on this thought. In fact, there's a couple little images here that I want you to to recognize that that uh, the muscle man there is God, and the scrawny, skinny arm is you, or other people. As we turn to the scriptures today, we are going to be reminded about how, how there are going to be some scrawny men trying to arm wrestle God. And the big picture of, of what we're going to be talking about is, is what, what is this God that lets himself lose some arm wrestling matches with mere mortals? What kind of God is this? And as you listen to this, we move in the direction of the cross of Calvary. Well, let's, let's just pray. I want you to be thinking about times when you're confused about God. Is, is he really all-powerful? Doesn't seem like it. And so let that be in the back of your mind as we go through today's text. Let's pray. So now, Father, as we find ourselves before you, as we turn to the scriptures, as we wrestle with this thought that you are almighty, and yet at times you look very weak, we humbly come before you and ask that you help us understand your, your ways. Your thoughts are so much higher than ours. So help us rise up to them through the scriptures. By your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we continue to go through the Gospel of Mark, I invite you to turn to that Gospel. We'll be in uh, Gospel of Mark chapter 2. What the analogy, the wording that I'm going to use for this is uh, pushing God around. And we're going to see that right from the get-go, God is going to get pushed around when he arrives on planet Earth.
in uh, Luke chapter 2. I do want you to, to read those verses because of just the, uh, the importance of why Christ was born in Bethlehem. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea. Again, note he went from Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. I, I deferred to Luke because, and we'll go back to Mark. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, we read that passage first so you understand why Christ was in Bethlehem. Christ is in Bethlehem because of politics. So if we could advance to our slides, you'll see that uh, he is getting pushed by politics. Does God notice the politics of government? He does. He's getting pushed by the politics of the matter of the Roman government, forcing God to relocate. And so now let's, let's consider what we read in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. Oh, I'm sorry. Matthew. Thank you. I'm glad you're paying attention to all this. Matthew chapter 2. It's the, the Magi. See, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that's where we connected with the, the, the Gospel of Luke. We know why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It was because of the Roman government, the, the, the matter of politics. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jew? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And then we'll skip down to verse 6. Uh, you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. Isn't that interesting? There's a prophecy here. So, on, on the one hand, Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, God the Son, is getting pushed by politics, but in another, in another sense, he is pulled there way ahead of time by prophecy. It's prophecy that Christ be born in Bethlehem. Joseph was not planning on leaving Nazareth until um, the census took place and politics forced him to relocate and go to Bethlehem at the most inconvenient time. Joseph may have thought, no. Oh, this is, this, this is incredible. This is frustrating. This is more than frustrating. God, you brought this about. You, you announced the birth of, of Christ. You, you, you announced it through an angel to Mary. Then you announced it to me in a dream. And, but now, really, are we going to have to go through this travel for miles and miles all because of taxes? Are you kidding? Can you imagine the frustration that could be here? But then again, back up a little further. 
and recognize that God is not being pushed by the politics of human man, but pulled by the prophecy. And so this great God in the wrestling match with the Roman government, who wins? It looks as though the Roman government won the wrestling match. No, not so at all. It was the Father allowing it to happen because of prophecy. It was his plan all along that Jesus be born in Bethlehem, the son of David. And the Magi are all part of this. They're asking, uh, getting back to verse 2. Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star. We've come to worship him. King Herod heard this. He was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. And he called together the people's chief priests and teachers of the law and asked them where the Christ was to be born. And they knew because they, could, they knew the prophecy. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. This is what the prophet had written. So God's response of the politics of pushing him around is humility. He didn't get upset at the politics of taxes. Sometimes we would like God to get upset at the politics of taxes. He did not. In humility, you must remember that Jesus is meek and lowly and humble. He is God. God the Son. God the Father is humble as well. And we see that here. But that's not the first time that God gets pushed around. Because secondly, he's going to get pushed by a king. So let's read a little further now. Beginning at verse 13. This is after the Magi have gone. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and during the night they left for Egypt. Well, Jesus, God the Son, fully God, fully man, a helpless babe, He's getting pushed around again by a king, Herod. I want, I want you to know a little bit about Herod. Uh, Herod is the first of several Herods mentioned in the Bible, but this is the one that built the temple. Uh, he built Masada. Have you heard of Masada? Uh, you could go on YouTube and explore about that his, part of history in Israel. Tremendous, tremendous uh, place of defense. Uh, and he gave back taxes during economic hard times, so that was, that was pretty amazing. He organized food relief during a severe famine. But as great as his accomplishments were, he had great paranoia. He did not want anyone in line for the throne. He had sons and sons' friends and wives. And one by one, they would die. He didn't want anyone taking his throne. He was cruel. He also had a incurable disease. He wanted to make sure the entire nation would mourn his death. So he arranged to have all the prisoners, all the Jewish prisoners killed on the day of his death so that Israel would mourn his death. So when we look back at verse 3, this is back when the Magi are looking for the Christ child. They don't know where to go. Verse 3, when, Herod, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Why was he disturbed? That's his paranoia. He has put people to death for far worse. But this is a possibility. And so... The rumor gets around in Jerusalem that Herod 
Herod has heard about a king, that's trouble, trouble in the horizon. And so we understand that a king's push, look at how deceitful Herod is, look at verse 7. Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said this, Go and make a careful search for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Do you think he was going to go and worship him? No. No. This is a king that wanted to kill any any rival. So it was Herod's attempt to push God around. In fact, he would try to kill God incarnate, Jesus Christ. We see this in its greatest example of his evil nature, verse 16. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, see, they didn't report back to him. He was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. All right, so that sounds terrible, right? Is God in control? It sure doesn't look like it because God is getting pushed around. You know what could have been written? God is almighty. He's wrapped in flesh, now dwelling among us. And we could have read something like this in the scriptures. When Herod and his evil Roman army entourage arrived at the house of Joseph and Mary, the tiny child Jesus simply extended his hand and pointed his finger at Herod and vaporized him and the whole body of evildoers. That would make good movie footage, wouldn't it? Do you think Jesus could do that? Absolutely. We don't know, we don't understand the mystery of the incarnation, fully God, fully man. But Jesus set aside his prerogatives as the authority, but he did not lose his authority. Jesus said, do you not know that I could call on 10,000 angels? At my defense, he could have done that. How do we know that, that God, yes, he was getting pushed around. He had to flee Bethlehem. But then again, he is getting pulled away from Bethlehem. Do you know why? Because of prophecy. Because of prophecy. We see this in uh, two respects. So look at verse 14 now. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. That's out of Hosea. And if, if you look at that passage, it's just really interesting how the New Testament authors interpret the Old Testament. And it gives you a little insight. It's inspired insight of the Old Testament. And in Hosea, it's talking about how Israel is coming out of Egypt. Israel is coming out of Egypt. But you see, Israel is like a type of, of Christ. Israel is delivered from slavery to live in the promised land and be a witness to the world. In the same way, Christ will come out of Egypt and be a proclamation to the world. So that's, that's the first part, that there's this pull of prophecy. God all along wanted, wanted his son to live in Egypt. But what about this other terrible thing, this attempt by Herod to kill God? And 
he slays all those innocent children. Was God under control? Is God still almighty? Very important question. We do not understand the ways and will of the Lord. But what I can tell you is that God was pulled for even we have this prophecy. Verse 17. This is after Herod decided to kill all those innocent babies, two years old and under. But it fulfilled what the prophet Jeremiah wrote. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. It is a, a prophecy. Herod, even in his evil, is not pushing God around. But God, in his all knowledge, all knowing, almighty power, has known this from the beginning. Again, I, I do not understand the will and ways of God. But I believe the scriptures that God is in control. He has not let go of the wheel of this universe, even in the evil things that people do. So let's look at a third example. As we go through this passage, now the Christ child is in Egypt with his family. Well, let's see what happens next. Verse 19. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to, a, go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. Okay, Herod's dead. And the people that were under his authority, well, that whole circle of people were dead. So he can just return to Nazareth, right? Excuse me, to, uh, to Bethlehem, right? Well, let's read. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. That was his instruction. But when he heard that Archelaus, Archelaus, that's hard to pronounce, but that's the son of Herod. And by the way, he is just as bad as his father Herod. In fact, the Roman government banished him in 6 BC. This, this was a bad character. So uh, he heard that Ar Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there, having been warned in a dream. So he withdrew to the district of Galilee and went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So once again, we see we see God being pushed around, only this time it's, it's by another king. Fear of another king. Since when is God afraid of anyone? And yet it brings up this mystery that it, it, it appears as though God is not almighty. That God has yet allowed another interruption. But has he really allowed an interruption to his plan? Well, that's why when you read the scriptures, you just read all of them. And so let's consider what, what all unfolds. Verse 23, And he went and lived in the town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Isn't that interesting? Once again, he's pulled by prophecy. Now, I could go into more detail of, of, of Nazarene. Is that a prophecy in the Old Testament? Not per se, but there. this is where commentators really like to explore possibilities. Uh, but here, here's the gist of it. Um, the, uh, the word uh, Nazarene is, is a word that implies... Um, a uh, living on the wrong side of town, uh, living in a place that it doesn't have the best of reputations. 
it's uh, he's he's on the wrong side of the tracks. Are you getting a sense of what I'm saying? Uh, that it's not it's not really a place that a king, a messiah should be. And we uh, we look at this and I, I think of the scriptures when when um, the, the people are hearing Jesus for the first time. This is in Galilee and 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 then Nathaniel gets an invitation from his brother to come and, and meet the Messiah. They think he's the Messiah. And do you remember Nathaniel's reaction? John chapter one, verse 46. Listen to this. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He would have never expected the Messiah. Are you kidding? Out of Nazareth? I don't think so. And yet, that is what God's plan was for the Christ child. Is God getting pushed around? It may look that way. But he's not. He's got a plan. And Jesus did much of his ministry from starting from that hub of Nazareth and all around the Sea of Galilee. What do we see in this? That God is humble. And his plan is fulfilled. And now we come to the last example where it seems as though God is being pushed around. Let us prepare for communion because it seems as though Jesus is once again being pushed, pushed to Calvary, pushed by Pilate. But as we've seen before, this is God's plan. He is pulled by the prophecy, dying on Calvary for you and me. Sometimes we just wrestle with, is God in control? And we wrestle with that and have doubts with it because of the suffering we go through. I want to remind you that as we come to communion, we're reminded that God allowed his only begotten son, God the Father, allowed his only begotten son to be pushed to Calvary by Pilate, by the men and women who cried out, crucify him. But he really wasn't being pushed to Calvary. The pull to Calvary was the Savior to fulfill the prophecies of Christ as the suffering Lamb of God. The scriptures say, let us examine ourselves so we partake of communion. Uh, this is a tradition of our church family. If you're watching this in your home, I encourage you to just take a moment, put it on pause and get um, some, some juice and a piece of bread and prepare for communion where we remember once again the humility of God allowing himself to be pushed to the cross, pulled there by the prophecies of his death. Let us pray. Almighty God, we humble ourselves before you and we worship you as almighty God of having a plan that is never interrupted by the evil of men. You are never frustrated by what happens in politics, what happens in plans in the, the, the dark alleys, the unfolding of suffering and death. We don't understand it all but we rest in the assurance that you are in control. Forgive us if it seems as though 
we think you're being pushed around and out of control. We renew our faith in you that you have a plan. So as we come to the foot of the cross, we are reminded of your great humility and your power and nothing stopped you from accomplishing our salvation. So we thank you. Amen. Each of us has an individually wrapped uh, communion cup. And so for this, uh, the first uh, part of our communion service, uh, you can take off the very top cellophane transparent cover for the wafer. The Apostle Paul wrote about this. He wrote, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you entered into this world wrapped in flesh, living a perfect life, to rescue us from our sin. We were the sinners. We were doomed to death and hell. We had no hope, but you came to rescue us by dying on the cross, taking our sin upon yourself. You received the wrath of God that we might be forgiven and have peace with God. And we remember this and give you thanks. Amen. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In passing, I, I want to just mention that it appeared as though Jesus was being pushed to Calvary he was arrested, he was tried, trumped up charges, false accusations, and ramrodding it through the politics of Pilate, they demanded that he be crucified. Once again, it looks as though he's being pushed. But we read this in the scriptures, in the prophecy, and this is why it is important to know all of the scriptures. It's important to know both Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament has all these prophecies that reveal that God's plan has not changed. In Isaiah 53, let me just read some verses. Verse 3, we read, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and familiar with suffering. Verse 7, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord 
will prosper in his hand. Each time you're tempted to doubt God being almighty, because it sure seems like he's being pushed around, remind yourself, God is in control. The prophecies reveal that his plan is never stopped, is never altered. And so let's uh, close our time together by singing a song of praise. It's the song, Since I Have Been Redeemed, bought by the precious blood of Christ. So we glory in his name. I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior King, since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a Christ who satisfies, since I have been redeemed, to do His will my highest price since I have been redeemed since I have been redeemed since I have been redeemed I will glory in his name since I have been redeemed I will glory in my Savior's name I have a witness bright and clear since I have been redeemed, dispelling every doubt and fear, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed. Where I shall live eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. I will glory in His name since I have been redeemed. I will glory in my Savior's name. Amen. Amen to that. You may be seated.